We are back, and we are joined now by Jacob Sugarman, lifestyle editor at the uh, Buenos Aires Herald, former managing editor of Truth Dig, uh, who wrote a piece in The Nation entitled Argentina's Son of Sam, Presidential Election. Uh, Jacob joins us from Buenos Aires right now. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. So um, Sunday's elections. Uh, over the weekend, we had some lukewarm good news coming out of Argentina, right? The uh, far-right libertarian candidate did not get the necessary votes to win in the first round of the elections, as uh, had uh, and, and he had been favored. So this is welcome news. Um, I know that uh, Lula has spoken out against him. Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia, who is a leftist, has spoken out against him. Um, what makes him so dangerous and what happened on Sunday? Right. So um, I think before we talk about the elections on Sunday, it's helpful just to look back towards August when there was a primary election. Um, and during that election, uh, Millet ended up winning uh, the most votes with just under 30 percent. So there was a kind of widespread fear that he would uh, be the next president, um, that he was on a fast track to being elected on Sunday, and if not on Sunday, then in a runoff in November. And what happened was that um, the kind of center-left coalition, um, Union por la Patria, which, uh, whose candidate was Sergio Massa, uh, ended up winning 37% of the vote, and uh, Millet's vote share didn't really budge. Uh, if anything, it went down just a tick from, from August. Uh, so there will be a runoff in November. And, um, you know, I think it is important to, to really see this as sort of lukewarm news, uh, because it's not guaranteed that Massa is going to prevail. Um, I think, you know, Sunday's results certainly increase the odds that he will be Argentina's next president. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that 30% of the country voted for Malay and just under 24% of the country voted for another pretty far right candidate named Patricia Bullrich, um, who's part of the Juntos por el Cambio coalition. So that's, you know, 54% of the country voting for a far right figure of one kind of strain or another. Um, and we'll see now where those votes, her votes, uh, Bullrich's votes end up going uh, when it comes to a runoff. Uh, to answer your question about what makes Millet so dangerous, um, you know, he's not part of the Argentine political establishment. Um, that has sort of been his whole kind of appeal uh, to Argentine voters who have grown increasingly disillusioned over the last decade as the country's economy has stagnated. Um, and his ideas, you know, realistic or not, are completely out there. Um, I mean, I'm not even talking about his proposals to sell human organs on the free market. Um, he positions himself as a kind of a radical libertarian. He's identified as an anarcho-capitalist. Um, you know, awesome. even if you said <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's permanently on one. Um, but he, uh, he, you know, even his sort of more reasonable proposals, if you want to call them that, or, or at least ideas that are within kind of the, the you know, I, I'm reluctant to call them within the mainstream, but, but ideas that, you know, potentially he could enact. Um, you know, doing away with the Argentine Central Bank, um, abandoning the peso for the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, again, I don't know if, if, if he has the congressional support to be able to push these kinds of things through. Um, I know that the uh, Chief Justice of the Argentine Supreme Court has said doing so would be unconstitutional. Um, but, you know, these are, are policies that would have a tremendous impact on, on working people. Uh, and, you know, poverty is above 40% right now. Inflation stands at 138%. Um, people are struggling to begin with. And this would just sort of obliterate, you know, what little kind of spending power they have um, and really do tremendous damage to both the Argentine economy and, and you know, working class people altogether. 
I mean, another, uh, I almost want to read directly from your piece here because you have this paragraph that lists some of these, but I'm just going to do that because it's absolutely insane. <laughs> Millet has campaigned on privatizing the country's public education system and many of its state-owned companies. He has vowed to dynamite the uh, Argentine Central Bank and dollarize the nation's economy over the protestations of economists and former government ministers. He has sworn to roll back abortion rights and sex education, despite identifying as a former, quote, san tantric sex instructor. He has advocated loosening gun regulations and at different junctures indicated that he it should be legal to sell your organs or your children on the open market. He claims to have cloned his deceased dog and is reported to have communicated with him through a medium. And as of ri this writing, he is the odds on favor to become the country's next president, even as his own supporters disapprove of many of his positions. So the question there is, what is happening in Argentina that a guy like this, a far-right libertarian pseudo-populist figure with those insane views can, can, can be the front runner in the elections in a few weeks? Right. I mean, I'm not sure that he's the front runner now. The piece was published ahead of the election. Gotcha. So I think, I think it's safe to say that, that Massa has sort of kind of leapfrogged him and is probably the favorite um, heading into the November runoff. Although, again, you know, it's still very much up in the air. Um, you know, it, the answer to that question is, is complicated and, and quite long. Um, but what we've seen is, you know, more than a decade of economic stagnation in the country. Um, you know, the, the population has increasingly lost faith in its political establishment to kind of improve their material circumstances, which continue to get worse with each passing year and really even month. Um, you know, even over the past few months, we've seen the, the value of the peso completely crater. Um, and, you know, salaries aren't keeping pace with, with this inflation, which goes up, you know, month over month. And so along comes this economist who, you know, really wasn't quite an obscure figure, but mostly he existed as sort of a, a media entity before he entered Congress in 2021. And, you know, his ideas feel radical because what he is proposing is a complete break with this Argentine state. Um, he, you know, I, I don't think people quite understand uh, necessarily the implications of dollarization, but if you just sort of hear that term, the, the idea is like, oh, you know, if I can earn a salary in dollars, that will radically improve my my standard of living. Um, I think, you know, a lot of voters maybe don't totally grasp what, what that would um, entail and, and what the kind of economic repercussions would be of, of abandoning the, the sovereign currency. Um, and, you know, again, I, I've seen these sort of comparisons thrown around between him and Trump and Bolsonaro. It's important to, to note that, that his sort of policy proposals are quite distinct in a lot of ways. Um, he is much more of a kind of libertarian uh, than I think those, those two figures. Um, but, you know, at least rhetorically, um, there are some similarities. I mean, another part of, of Millet's appeal is that he you know, will say just the most outlandish things possible. Um, you know, he he referred to another economist as a mongoloid, uh, and this drew criticism from the largest uh, autism, excuse me, was that, sorry, I think it was actually a, a Down syndrome um, uh, organization, in, in Argenti yeah. organization in Argentina. So, you know, Again, I, I, I think the idea is not necessarily that his politics align perfectly with those far right figures, but that, um, you know, he offers that same kind of libidinal release to say things that people previously didn't feel comfortable saying, um, hurtful, outrageous, kind of violent things. Uh, and that has found traction here, mostly with uh, young men, it should be noted, um, that sort of is the, the base of his support. Um, but young people in general are sort of have gravitated to him. Um, I think I mentioned a statistic in, in, that, in that piece that something like 62% of his base is um, 16 to 30 years old. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that comes from these kids kind of growing up in an economy that offers very little opportunity and they just sort of feel like, well, 
what other, you know, nothing is working. And so why not give this a shot? Can you speak a bit about how the economy got to that point? Um, I, I, um, my understanding is that previous administrations um, had taken out an, uh, an, an IMF loan um, and there has been a, a lot of kind of restrictions placed on um, the the way that business can be conducted really in Argentina, if you don't mind, and from the government's perspective, not actual business. But um, if you don't mind expanding on that. on that, Yeah, sure. So um, the previous administration, uh, so of Mauricio Macri, who is part of the Juntos por el Cambio coalition, which is sort of the broad center-right party in, in Argentina, uh, took out a $57 billion loan from the IMF in, I believe it was 2018. And, you know, theoretically, the idea was that this loan was going to be able to pay off all of Argentina, if not all of Argentina's external debt to help pay some of that off. Much of that debt was to, for previous loans from the IMF. Um, and, you know, in practice, what it ended up doing was finance this sort of massive capital flight from the country. And, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, major corporations and a lot of wealthy citizens were able to sort of buy up dollars, keep them overseas, um, avoid kind of tax payment. And so what we've seen in the years since is in inflation has kept going on up. Um, we have seen uh, poverty rise steadily. Uh, and to this day, Argentina kind of remains under the thumb of this international lender. Uh, and, you know, I think part of Sergio Massa's, I wouldn't say his appeal, but one of the reasons why he's sort of considered a, a more of a moderate candidate is that he has sort of pledged to kind of balance Argentina's budgets. Um, that would be kind of a, a mixture of, of some austerity measures. Um, although to his credit, he has been quite adamant about, about his desire to protect uh, public education and public health care. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Argentina remains in, in dire economic straits, and I don't think a figure like Millet could have gained the traction that he did were things not as bad as they are. Uh, and whoever wins in November is going to inherit, you know, a, a, a country that is in, in shambles in a lot of ways. I mean, so so Massa, would you describe uh, him as a centrist candidate, essentially? And, and, and what does that, if you entail, um, and, and what are the challenges that that presents when you're facing somebody like Millet, um, who is a wrecker in, in every sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, Massa comes from the, from the right wing of the Peronist coalition. Um, it's kind of complicated, but Argentina doesn't, has many different political parties and then sort of voting blocks that, that kind of pull together into these different coalitions. Sergio Massa comes from the right of the kind of broad center-left coalition that is known as the, as the Peronists. Um, and his policy proposals are mostly centered around extraction, shale gas, um, lithium, and kind of balancing out uh, Argentina's you know, fiscal debt, which will obviously take many years. Um, but he, you know, he himself is, is, I don't think, has made any kind of, I don't want to say that he, let me back that up a little bit. It's not that he hasn't made certain promises, but I, I don't I don't think the idea that somehow, like, this is not Lula. Uh, this is not even Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Um, this is someone who, you know, comes from a, a more conservative background. Um, and in the kind of lead up to the election, he did make some overtures to, to workers. Um, he sort of rolled back a, a sales tax or allowed kind of, people who, who spend within the country to, to recover some of those funds. He also eliminated an income tax for a number of other workers as, as sort of a way to kind of appease, um, you know, working classes and the middle classes at, ahead of the vote. Uh, but austerity or in some shape or form is coming one way or another, whether it's sort of this extreme uh, version under Millet or a kind of more moderate kind of managed plan under Massa. Well, that's um, just notable because there have been obviously some resurgent center left or leftist movements.
movements um, in uh, other countries in Latin America. I mean, uh, I mentioned earlier um, some of the 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 uh, other leaders who have been in opposition uh, to Millet, like uh, Lula and Petro as well. This feels yeah. like a situation where uh, Argentina isn't hasn't caught up to some of the um, in, insurgent political re- uh, uh, movements in, in neighboring nations. C- can you speak a bit about the unique nature of why that is the case um, and, and why the, this kind of centrist is uh, the, the representative to face off against this very dangerous figure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that the left is in retreat in Argentina right now. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that their kind of party or coalition was in power during the pandemic and in the years afterwards. So they, you know, what we've seen throughout Latin America and really throughout much of the Western world is that, you know, there's a, a strong desire to throw out governments that have been uh, kind of ruling during these very difficult economic and social times. And Argentina's center-left coalition has been in power through the pandemic, through a world historic drought that hit the country last year, which is itself a product of climate change. When you really have a kind of confluence of a lot of different world crises at once uh, happening in Argentina. So, Yeah, I mean, I think all of that kind of contributes to a strong anti-Peronist sentiment. Um, And what may yet save Massa uh, is that his opposition is just so bonkers and so out there that I think, you know, Argentina can't stomach, uh, you know, electing this guy. We'll see if if that's the case. Um, You know, already Millet has started making overtures to Juntos para el Cambio, which is the kind of more established center-right party. Um, and, you know, we'll see if just how strong anti peronism is in Argentina. Um, I know that sort of anti petismo sort of a, an anti-workers party sentiment in Brazil near, nearly carried Bolsonaro to victory in 2022. Um, but yeah, that's sort of, I guess, kind of the, the panorama of why you don't see kind of a, a leftist figure emerging in Argentina the way that Boric has in Chile and Gustavo Petro has in Colombia and Lula has you know, returned in, in, in Brazil. Um, you know, some of this is also kind of a product of timing. Uh, oh, uh, and uh, uh, lastly here, before I let you go, um, you also yeah. wrote about how... Um, Millet and the vice presidential pick, uh, Victoria Villaruel, I hope I'm not um, mispronouncing her name, that they... Close enough. Be, be okay, I won't even attempt it. You can just fill in the blank for me, all right? Um, I, 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 uh, I was concerned about many things in your piece, but it, uh, one of the, the things that you wrote about is their uh, kind of revisionism of past atrocities that had been committed um, during the, the, the military uh, regime in the 70s and 80s in Argentina. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what that says more broadly about their political ideology? Right. So um, Victoria Michel who is the, the vice presidential candidate of Malay and a member of Congress herself, um, her own family was, uh, were, military officers within the regime, within the junta, uh, or maybe not part of the junta itself, but part of the, the military establishment during the dictatorship. Um, and what they have done is they've, you know, there's sort of a broad consensus within the country and, and abroad that, that the past dictatorship either killed or disappeared uh, 30,000 people. And um, within Argentina, there is sort of a kind of denialist movement that maintains that that number was actually closer to 8,000 or that the number was invented kind of whole cloth. And what they have spent a kind of a portion of this campaign doing is kind of reifying that notion or at least you know, lending a credence um, that, uh, you know, in fact, what Argentina experienced was not uh, state-sponsored terrorism, but a kind of dirty war uh, between 
two opposing forces. One was the, uh, the nation's military and the other was this left-wing guerrilla force that was split up into a bunch of different groups um, and that each sort of performed stochastic acts of terror. Um, and, you know, obviously this is dangerous on, on a number of levels. It's, it's a complete rewriting of, of history. And for, you know, Argentinians, it's, it's sort of opening up a, a wound that has not healed uh, and likely won't for, you know, many decades to come uh, and sort of kind of challenged consensuses that were, were already in place. Um, I think, you know, since Argentina's return to democracy, it's been established that, you know, this is this is what had happened, um, and it had sort of reckoned with those crimes. And now uh, we have a, a presidential contender, and until recently a presidential front runner, who was willing to entertain just sort of the most reactionary uh, theories of, of of what actually happened during the during the dictatorship. Well, um, the flattening of power dynamics committed by. Uh states versus uh, other groups and writing uh, rewriting history i don't know where we're seeing that in the news lately it just is totally foreign to me uh jacob i mean sounds sound familiar <laughs> a little bit um but really appreciate your time today people can read the piece in the nation it's really extensive and well done if you want to get yourself up to date on what's happening in argentina uh it's called argentina's son of sam presidential election it's in the nation we'll put a link to that piece uh in the description below or wherever you're listening to this um and at majority.fm thank you so much jacob really appreciate your time today my pleasure thank you for having me yep of course